Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here uh, with us. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today. And we have a very special guest, Professor Maham, from Delft University Technology, that I had the opportunity to know in 2015 during the famous Delft Road Safe Course. Professor Maham graduated in experimental psychology and received her doctorate at the Leiden University. Her research and education activities focus on the road safety effects of the transport system, with particular interest in road use behavior aspects. Research topics include distraction and traffic, safety of vulnerable road users, road users interaction with road infrastructure, in vehicle technology, and automated vehicles. She also holds a part-time position at the Norwegian Center of Transport Research. So, Professor Marham, thank you so much for your time. Please, the audience is yours now. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for introducing uh, introducing me. Um, we had some technical problems uh, sharing my screen, and I don't see anything else but my own screen now. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, the presentation will be clear. Uh, it, it really illustrates the topic, actually, of my presentation today uh, with automated vehicles and technologically uh, difficult situations. Um, as Anna already told uh, you, uh, we met uh, some years ago during uh, the Delft Road Safety Course, uh, which took place in the Netherlands then, and she was attending. So it was really nice that you invited me for this uh, talk today. Um, this is a brief overview of the contents of my presentation today. After an, an introduction, I will go more into the role of human behavior in automated driving systems. Um, and thereafter, I will go uh, into the interaction uh, pedest of pedestrians and cyclists with automated vehicles in more depth. Uh, I will show you some research examples of my own group. Uh, but first, um, this is where I uh, work. Uh, it is uh, quite quiet nowadays at the campus uh, in Delft because most people work from home, uh, unfortunately. But you see this, uh, this uh, single cyclist still uh, going through the campus. Um, I have a few slides to provide you with some information about our university. So these are just some facts and figures. Uh, there are, it is quite, uh, um, quite a large university uh, with around uh, 25,000 students uh, it, it's a figure from 2018, 
Uh, you see the number of staff. Um, it's just to give you an, uh, uh, an um, global overview. Um, to Delft has uh, different faculties, uh, and I am working in the civil engineering and geosciences faculty. Uh, in, in that faculty, this is the building actually, how it looks like. Um, and um, I'm in the Department of Transport and Planning, one of the departments. Um, the Transport and Planning uh, Department is a very multidisciplinary group. Uh, we, uh, we have um, um, engineers and uh, lots of people with other educational backgrounds. And I fit perfectly well there because I'm a psychologist by background, actually. I uh, really like to work with all people uh, with their different backgrounds in, in Delft. Um, if we focus a little bit more on the transport and planning uh, uh, department, we are about 150 people in the department, uh, around 40 staff. Uh, among which uh, six professors and around 80 PhDs and postdocs. So quite a number. And our research and education is uh, organized in the department within labs. And in, a, in total, we have 11 labs. Uh, I'm director of one of these labs, namely the traffic and transportation safety lab. You see the picture of the lab uh, here together with my colleague Hanin Farah. And we carry out research and provide education on traffic safety, infrastructure design, and related subjects. If you are interested, uh, you can find some more information about the lab and the people and projects we do in our lab through the link that you see uh, down below on the slide. And there you find also some more information about the Delft road safety course I just mentioned. Um, this slide also shows the different themes we address in our lab. Uh, we work on safety models, road user safety, infrastructure design and safety, vehicle automation and safety. Uh, low middle income countries is one of the topics and methods and data. Uh, and uh, today, my presentation includes some more in-depth examples of the research we perform in these two themes, road users and vehicle automation safety. So I will start now with a, a brief introduction to automated transport and the role of people, humans, in automated driving. So here is a very simple sketch of the traffic system uh, with the three main components in it. Um, and um, when one thinks of automated vehicles, uh, uh, it is the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the car and vehicle technology. Um, that is an important, uh, that is an important uh, component, of course, because the technology uh, allows us to make life easier for people, have uh, assistance in driving a car and uh, perhaps uh, prevent some errors that humans normally do in traditional traffic. Uh, so technology is, is not an easy thing and it comes in several forms and sizes and uh, types. Uh, as yet, uh, to, technology is developing and becoming better every day, but for a long time there will be a mix of all kinds of road users, either or not automated or partially automated on the road. And here you see some examples uh, on, the, on the left top side, uh, you see uh, the um, uh, passenger car, you know, the, the Several brands have these partial automated systems. Uh, there's minibuses, AV shuttles, also called uh, the famous Google car on the down left part of the picture, nowadays Waymo car. And on the right side, uh, you see uh, an example of truck platooning. So they, these are trucks 
that drive in a platoon and only the first driver is actually uh, monitoring the whole uh, platoon and the other uh, trucks are connected and follow closely behind one another. So these are all different types of technology uh, that are involved. Um, but there's also people uh, that are really important when we talk, talk about automation. And that is sometimes um, forgotten or uh, not always uh, in, in, the, in the main view. And then when it comes to people, it is often assumed that technology solves the problem of human error. There's many accidents on the road uh, and many times um, um, it happens that people are distracted or don't follow the rules and sometimes accidents occur and technology can really help to make the driving task easier as I said. But the question is, will it actually solve the problem of human error in, in, in such a degree that we can really uh, talk about a, a large increase in safety because of technology? That is actually uh, what um, uh, is promised um, or um, yeah, is, is sort of promised uh, by uh, those who promote uh, automated cars. And um, I will just show you, um, but uh, there happen accidents actually involving uh, automation, uh, partially automated uh, vehicles nowadays. So as yet, the increase in traffic safety is not that clear uh, with the current uh, state of affairs. Uh, well, these are just some screenshots uh, from taken from newspapers. And uh, these are actually uh, serious crashes, deadly crashes. Uh, how and why did these accidents actually happen? And what was the role of the human and the vehicle in those accidents? Uh, that is not always clear cut, by the way, but uh, in depth studies performed by, for example, the NTSB in the US clearly illustrate that the automation often promises a little more than is realistic. And that can confuse uh, drivers uh, who have been promised maybe more than as yet can be delivered. For example, the sensors of these cars that should um, sense the, the, sur uh, the, the surroundings and other uh, road users there do not always work perfectly or do not always work in all conditions. And um, when it's raining, for instance, or snowing, there's uh, huge problems. And certain accidents happened because the sensors really didn't uh, sense what it actually should sense. And when a driver is sitting behind the wheel, relying and trusting the technology, that can cause dangerous situations, just as an example. And um, this is uh, a quote that comes from a report, uh, a quite recent report from the International Transport Forum. And uh, based on research findings so far, it seems that claims of a more than 90 reduction in road traffic deaths resulting from automation, eliminating, eliminating, eliminating crashes linked to human error are, for, are still untested. That is, of course, very difficult to do because there are not so many uh, automated vehicles on the road yet. So it's very difficult to test whether or not there's really uh, a large reduction. But the examples that I showed you just previously, uh, it, it shows in any case, that accidents are still possible, and it's a challenge to find out which uh, part of technology should be improved before people are actually um, able to deal with these technology. And that is sometimes overlooked. Um, this is um, um, a slide uh, illustrating the role of humans uh, in different levels of automation. 
As you might know, there are different organizations that have formulated levels of automation. And the most famous one is by the Society of Automotive Engineers. And um, it, they, they formulate different levels uh, going from zero to five. Uh, and this is actually uh, an illustration that I took from another publication. And you see from the left to the right, the degrees, the levels of automation, and then the humans sort of uh, slowly disappeared, uh, disappears from the, from the, from the picture. Uh, this is a similar uh, picture. Uh, my, I'm not sure what you see, but my screen is doing not what I intend. Okay. Uh, this is a similar picture illustrating the levels uh, of automation and the role of people. So um, the picture is based on a previous version of the SAA levels, but it's still very useful to illustrate the role of people. And um, the letters are very small, too small to read probably, but that is not really needed now. The pictures and icons show that up to level four, which is high automation, the small person in pink, uh, uh, in, in uh, blue, I mean, still holds the steering wheel with one hand. And it means that uh, even in high automation mood, uh, mode, there is still a role for humans to play. And uh, one could say that is only a minor role, but it doesn't mean that it is an easier role. What is uh, happening um, that the tasks that people are naturally good at um, are the most difficult to overtake in, to be overtaken by technology. So the technology starts to, um, to automate uh, tasks that are not really uh, needed for a high order uh, driving uh, in, 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 in traffic. And the more difficult the task becomes, uh, the better people can do it relative to automation. So even if they have a small task, it is the most difficult task that they have to, to continue to do. Um, this uh, is uh, another way of showing that, actually. Um, it is a it is a, pic, a picture taken from my inaugural speech a couple of years ago, and it also shows from left to right the non-automated uh, situation to the fully automated situation. And the fully automated situation, you see this little person uh, with the hands behind his head um, driving in, tra in traffic, but thinking about totally other things than traffic. He is, or she, is thinking about the shopping, what he's going to eat tonight, uh, that he's hungry. Uh, maybe every now and then he realizes he is still in traffic, but that is a minor thing. He can do all the other things that is on his mind. Uh, that is quite different from the situation we have today. Um, it, it, be, most people drive in non-automated cars or maybe some uh, assistant, uh, uh, assisted driving um, like uh, cruise control or something. But what is on their mind most of the time, and it should be on their mind, is um, other traffic. They have to deal with traffic lights, cars, uh, rules on the road. Uh, in the Netherlands, also lots of cyclists. And every now and then, they can think of something else, so completely different. But what you see now here in the middle is actually the situations we are coming to about and which will last probably decades. And that is the in-between situation. People um, driving a car need to switch between automation and non-automation because their car is not capable to fully drive on its own. Every now and then, um, you have to take over the driving task. And that is very difficult to do if you drive in a car which drives, say, 90%, say in the future, that is possible, 90% of the time on its own. But 10% of the time, it really has uh, uh, 
uh, it is the task is so complex that the car doesn't know to handle it and it will ask to the driver to take over and people are not built to be attentive to a, a very boring task actually monitoring your own vehicle uh, monitoring um, situations when it maybe doesn't know what to do anymore uh, so of course the driver starts to do other things and then suddenly a situation comes up um, like the ones we've shown in 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 uh, the slide, the, uh, uh, the sensors didn't notice another car, and suddenly you have to take over in in critical situations where there's no time. You have to react very quickly. While the situation of monitoring a boring, good running system makes people sort of slow and lazy. It takes them more time than usual actually to take over, and that is a, a situation which uh, will come up uh, more and more, the more uh, automation we will have in traffic. Um, and that is a very uh, almost impossible thing to solve, actually. Um, and it is also, instead of making the driving task easier, uh, one also need additional skills that we do not need now in normal manual driving. Because you also have to learn to monitor effectively you're, you have to learn to monitor your, your, your uh, car. You have to learn how to uh, 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 suddenly take over. And you have to learn how to switch to both tasks. So you have to learn the whole, a whole new procedure of driving manually uh, interchangeably with, with uh, take, letting uh, automation take over. And that also involves, uh, you can imagine, if you don't do not drive manually uh, so much any longer, your skills deteriorate. So if you don't practice, you will lose some skills to drive. So it's it's a very confusing and contradictory situation, which is often overlooked. Not only that it makes life easier as a car driver, it also makes life diff more difficult because you have to keep on training your manual driving skills. You have to learn extra tasks that you don't have to perform now. So it also uh, has uh, consequences for driver education uh, that will look completely different in the future. What uh, you have to know your car actually, what is the car actually taking over? You have to know when you can rely on the car, when you have to take over, actually practice uh, taking over every now and then, because otherwise uh, the moment you need it, uh, you will not be able to perform it anymore. So this is about humans and automation. Um, here I just put some hypothetical effects these higher levels of automation actually will have on people. So on the X, uh, um, axis below, that's from left to right, again, the level of automation, the more automation, the more to the right. And as I just said, people lose their driving skills. If you watch at the yellow, um, the yellow line, sort of uh, uh, simulating the, 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 the level of driving skills, if you have more automation and you don't practice enough, you will lose your driving skills. So that is not, bad, not, not a good uh, thing if you still have to take over. Um, um, your reaction time, the red line, uh, the red line uh, will actually increase because as I said, if, if, uh, if, if it is an easy task, you don't have to do a lot. Uh, the moment you have to uh, be able to, to intervene, your reaction time is slower than it is when you have to be attentive all the time. Um, uh, another concept which is relevant here is workload uh, and very closely related to the reaction time. Your workload will, uh, your experience will decrease the higher the level of automation and it is accompanied by an increase in reaction time. And there is this green uh, line, I'm not sure if it will look like this at all, but it is just to illustrate that uh, level of automation, you have to watch a lot of dashboards and a lot of uh, information in your car when monitoring 
the situation and if you have to take over or not. And that can be seen as a sort of distraction, actually, from the driving task. Um, and uh, the idea is in this graph that that will, of course, decrease with higher levels of automation because then it becomes really irrelevant uh, in the end if you are not either or not distracted because that doesn't play a role anymore. So these are just hypothetical lines and illustrate uh, that it is very difficult to predict what the sum of all these effects will be. Uh, will it a positive result for, pe for people and safety or will it be uh, a zero result or maybe even negative result? We don't hope that, of course, but we need to uh, keep this into, into the picture. And um, that is actually uh, what my area of research uh, uh, entails, to look at the people, how can we educate, train people to deal with automation and at the same time, um, I talk to my colleagues who know a lot about technology and uh, inform them how they can tune their technology so that people are actually able to work with it in the best manner. Um, and what I'm, I'm going to show you here is uh, taken from a, a recent paper from uh, Beaver uh, et al. And... Um, I have talked so far about the rule of the human driver within the automated uh, driving system, ADS here. And um, so some of, uh, some of the questions will actually be a result of system errors, technology or some uh, such things. Some will have to do with operator errors. Uh, that, that can be the case. Uh, as I told you, people can be too slow when they have to overtake uh, in difficult situations or they, are, they uh, have not been told how, the, uh, how their uh, task uh, looks like with this particular uh, type of vehicle. Uh, but what is uh, hardly looked at so far is the interactions with other vehicles and the environment. So how will the vehicle deal with other vehicles, manual driven vehicles, other drivers, other types of road users that not, are not automated at all, such as pedestrians and cyclists. And um, that is where the rest of my presentation will focus on. Um, so, okay, uh, this is just illustration, sorry. Um, you can always also look at these different types of worlds, basically, that uh, we talk about. So on the left, you see here what I would call the first world, maybe. The most attention and most uh, research is going into the self-driving technology of the cars. Advanced sen sensors, a focus of we must prevent human failures. Uh, that is the majority uh, of uh, research and development uh, as of now. And then we, you could see, well, this second, the second world, um, where there is already lots of research going on into the driver part. Uh, what I just show you. Uh, studies into workload, reaction times, learning new skills, uh, HMIs, human machine interfaces that can be tuned so that people can actually use it in the best way. Um, issues having to do with trust and acceptance of technology and even motion sickness as a result of driving in a car. You can imagine um, if people uh, start reading books or uh, do lots of other things while driving in an automated vehicle, they can suffer from motion sickness like uh, is the case nowadays with, uh, for instance, children sitting on the, on the back seat of cars, uh, looking into their, um, into their um, smartphone or whatever, and start to feel sick. Uh, that will probably also be a case uh, in, in automated vehicles if, um, if, the, the, if uh, the design is not tailored to humans. And then, 
uh, there is the third world, actually, so to speak. Uh, those is the, the group of non-users, uh, the poor pedestrians and cyclists um, that have no automation yet um, and have to deal with this automation coming to them. Um, and uh, this is uh, um, an, uh, a research area which is uh, still quite new. Um, there is research going on in, in Delft and other places in which from one side there is more and more um, um, focus on the technology. How can se the technology sense uh, pedestrians um, and cyclists, how can they notice them and um, can they perhaps predict their intentions? That would be great if the car knows that the, this pedestrian is not just walking along the street but is about to cross. Can, can our sensors and algorithm, algorithm mis, uh, interpret their behavior so that a car can uh, stop for them in time? Um, but it appears to be very, very difficult. I have colleagues uh, from another uh, department uh, in Delft who is actually working with it, on it. Uh, very exciting, but a very challenging job. And the other way around, uh, there is even less research. How do the pedestrians and cyclists themselves see and uh, act? when they come across an automated vehicles, uh, an automated vehicle. And that is, of course, uh, not easy to investigate because there are not so many of those vehicles on the road yet. So we have to find methodologies and paradigms to have some clue how these other road users will deal with automation in the future. And um, in the remaining part of my presentation, I will show you some examples uh, of the type of studies we do to, to find out a little bit more about uh, what pedestrians and cyclists actually uh, will encounter in the future. So this is an example um, uh, in which we investigated how the physical appearance of the automation and a mounted external human machine interface, a so-called EHMI, affects pedestrians crossing the in intention. So what we varied was the speed, the time gap, and the different types of each EHMIs uh, would have uh, we we varied them and we wanted to, to know what the effect was on on the on the pedestrians, and uh, we uh, used a virtual a type of virtual reality in which we blended uh, real videos of cars and uh, an AV shuttle um, in in a real environment and have a pedestrian a participant in our in our study watch these videos and then it would stop at a certain moment the question would appear uh, would you cross yes or no and the pedestrian had to push a button and we found this uh, this is a very safe way uh, to investigate um, how uh, pedestrians will actually um, interact with these vehicles and it uh, also allows uh, control over uh, the, the different variables that we were interested in. Uh, and uh, I will show you, it looks a bit like this. Um, the different, you see, four different uh, conditions and scenarios, actually. So on the, on the top left, you see this uh, automated uh, shuttle. Uh, on the right, uh, there's a normal passenger car and we also had either or not the zebra crossing that we uh, manipulated into the video. And at a certain moment, um, the, um, the vehicle stops, the, the pedestrian can look around and the question then arises, would you cross now? Um, that was interesting. I just show you the results. 
um, what we noticed in our results is that the speed of the vehicle, the gap size between the pedestrian and the vehicle, and the presence of a zebra crossing were the most significant predictors to cross the road, as it would do in nowadays life, actually. And we found no difference in the crossing intentions between the different vehicle types. Was it this automated shuttle or the conventional vehicle? It didn't really matter. And that is interesting um, because uh, that gives you an, an uh, idea of um, will pedestrians actually uh, notice that there's a difference or it, there's a difference? Will they modify their behavior? This st study looks like they don't. However, the participants who recognized the vehicle as an automated vehicle, we had some questionnaires there afterwards as well, they reported fewer intentions to cross. And that is interesting. You couldn't uh, see that from their actual behavior, but if you ask them, they, um, they show hesitations. And that is an indication of the trust they actually uh, have in automation nowadays. And the different types of symbols we use, the e, uh, HMIs, that indeed affect the road user's intention. So if you see, uh, if you show the red uh, sign, um, ac people actually uh, cross less often. And if you see, if you show the green uh, light, uh, people actually cross more often. So they have an effect. So this is just a few, um, a few details about the study that I want to show you. There's lots more into it, but um, uh, that you have an idea. So there's all, all sorts of other methodologies we use to try to find out a little bit more about uh, interactions between uh, vulnerable road users and automated vehicles. And uh, this is an example uh, from a recent study uh, where we used animated clips, actually. So this is animated uh, uh, stuff. And um, we, we uh, recorded uh, videos or made videos, animated videos, and that were, that those were shot from the perspective of a cyclist. You see the cyclist uh, steering uh, handles and the hands on the wheel. That is the perspective of the cyclist that was taken in this study. And um, we show an interaction with a vehicle, different types of vehicles, automated vehicles uh, who look differently. Uh, one, uh, one of the vehicles looked a little bit more like a Google car and other vehicles had these uh, signs on top. You see on the top left, if you look very carefully, you see the go uh, message from the vehicle. Um, and we wanted to know how cyclists deal with those types of situation. Um, and after each video, when it stopped uh, at a more or less critical situation, uh, the cyclists, the test persons, um, were asked to indicate whether they would slow down or continue cycling in this situation and how confident they were about this decision, what they thought the car would do and how confident they were about what the car would do. And um, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the, the, the appearance of the cars uh, varied. Um, and also what we did be before the experiment started, all the, the participants saw a, a sort of information uh, film about automation and automated uh, cars in the future. And we had three uh, versions of that um, of that uh, introductory video, which was served as a prime. And uh, one had a very positive tone that uh, automation was coming near, that it would be very safe in the future. Uh, one had a more neutral tone, and there was more one uh, video that uh, set a more uh, negative scene, so to see it. So it, it questioned technology. It says, well, it will take a long time. And it's not clear yet uh, what the future will like. I'm not so sure if this will be safe. 
And we were also interested if you present the test persons which either the positive, the neutral or the negative uh, video, would that have an effect on their behavior? So the next slide shows you just an example of one of the scenes we used that we had many, but this is one. It shows a very typical Dutch uh, cycling path. Um, uh, the animation, uh, th this could be a very real Dutch street and there's an intersection coming up and a car comes closer and there the video stops. And then the, the, the participant is asked, what would you do? Would you stop or would you uh, continue cycling, uh, etc.? Uh, so this is how it looked like. Uh, I just briefly show you this again. Yes. So um, after having uh, run this experiment, uh, these are some of the main results. Well, participants uh, gave priority more often uh, to an automated vehicle than a conventional vehicle, and that is interested. So that shows uh, that they have a little hesitant trust, so to speak, in technology. Uh, they uh, they maybe for security reasons or uh, because they were not really sure, they, for security's sake, stop more often in case of an AV. And um, when the uh, AV, however, communicated their intentions, you know, with that go sign, uh, they, they, they saw that and they listened to it and um, they then yielded less often uh, to it uh, than uh, the case was for the conventional vehicles. Participants also yielded more often for automated vehicles after the negative prime. And that is interesting. So if you tell people um, right before such a task, uh, a little pes pessimistic uh, information about technology and automated vehicles, they take that into account. So it, it implies that it is really important um, that what we convey in the news and that what the message that is conveyed by actually car manufacturers is uh, uh, resembling a realistic situation. If it is too positive, they listen to it. If it's too negative, they also listen to it. Um, the less participants uh, trusted the technologies and the uh, capabilities, capabilities of the automated vehicles, the more they tended to slow down in the complex situations. So this is one of the very first studies actually uh, looking into cyclists' um, behavior towards automated vehicles. And of course, it is, it's not a real life study. It is uh, using video clips and cyclists have um, perhaps never met such a vehicle in their whole life. So it is a glimpse and it is a start, but it of course doesn't tell us uh, how it would be uh, with many of those vehicles already on the road and people having learned maybe how to deal with them. Um, the last example I want to show you is uh, a methodology which is called the Wizard of Oz uh, methodology in which a, this, this car, we did this outside to resemble a more realistic uh, situation perhaps. This is uh, to Delft uh, premises uh, where there is a real road um, uh, where we have this vehicle dr dr driven, but it is not an real automated, uh, a real automated vehicle. It is a fake automated vehicle. We pretend it is like that, and in in fact, the passenger sitting next to the, the driver uh, is driving uh, with a joystick. Uh, so we can pretend that the, that the, the actual driver. Uh, is doing something else in this picture. This is one of the conditions we used in the experiment. There is this driver um, uh, reading a newspaper. Uh, and in, in that sense, we could manipulate different situations. We used different types of vehicles. They looked differently and they had different messages. And we 
asked pedestrians to stand there. This is one person standing there. We asked them, when would you cross? And they had to indicate that. Uh, we also recorded uh, perceived safety and lots of other stuff in, in question afterward. Um, I have, let me see. Um, these were actually the, the different appearances of the cars we used. Uh, so you see uh, on the top left is the traditional vehicle, which is manu manually driven, and uh, the person behind the steering wheel uh, is really looking attentive at the road. Uh, there is this sort of, we call it a non-recognizable automated vehicle. It is a normal car. It is driven with a joystick, um, and you see the, the driver with a newspaper. Uh, top uh, down left, you see um, the automated vehicle uh, equipped with uh, some amateuristic uh, signs on the hood and the door showing that it was an automated vehicle, or a uh, on, the, on the bottom right, uh, just a, a, a brief message on the top showing uh, that this is a self-driving. Does this actually do something to people? Um, this is the situation. We had cameras uh, recording uh, from different positions. Uh, there were uh, cones indicating the distance, so we could do some interesting um, uh, measurements. Of course, speed was recorded uh, and we analyzed all pictures in the end. Um, I don't have time uh, to show you all the details results, but one, one of the things that come out, came out of this study is that indeed um, half of the participants thought that the vehicle was actually sometimes driven automatically. So even this very simple um, amateuristic, one would, could say, manipulations, made people believe that they had they were dealing with a real automated vehicle. Um, what was also interesting and uh, confirms the results on, from our previous uh, studies that the critical gap, the distance uh, between the vehicle and the pedestrians and the self-reported level of stress show no statistically significant differences between the vehicle conditions. People seem to have this built-in uh, motor program or schema that when a car uh, approaches them, they start uh, crossing in front of it uh, in a certain manner, regardless of the type of vehicle that, is, uh, that it is uh, about. And it is also interesting that nevertheless, most participants report they did perceive differences in vehicle appearance and reported to have been influenced in their decision to cross. We couldn't measure that from the objective recorded uh, situations. There was no differences between uh, their behavior in case of automation or a conventional car, but they reported to have seen differences and they think they had adjusted their behavior on the safe side, uh, similar to our previous experiments. So this is what I just wanted to show as a sort of glimpse of the research that my group is doing in Delft on this topic. And it is all looking into the future uh, because we really want to have an idea how people will interact with them so we can inform, um, uh, inform the developers of technology and uh, so they can take into account uh, how uh, cyclists and pedestrians will actually deal with their products and make it, uh, make it safer from the start instead of experiencing it only when it comes on the road. Uh, of course, uh, there is one component uh, that is really important uh, as well. Uh, but um, uh, that will be another talk, I would, I would say, not today. Um, and the final picture I want to show you is this. This is a little bit of a joke, but with a serious undertone. It is made by an artist and the work, the work is called Autonomous Trap. 
And what you see is a car sitting in the middle of a parking lot. And it has been surrounded by this magic circle. Uh, in the language of road markings, the dotted white lines uh, on the outside say, please come in. And when you actually drive into that circle, the, uh, the continuous markings on the inside tell that you never can get out again. So it is a, it is a funny picture. But it is important for automated vehicles uh, to have an uh, infrastructure and markings that uh, their sensors and the car can understand and that will not lead to situations like this. But again, uh, this will be in uh, a future talk, uh, not today. So uh, to conclude, um, my main messages are actually uh, human behavior and control remain important, even in automation. And uh, it is very important to include behavioral factors and preferences in automated driving research. Uh, of course, we need to do this in an interdisciplinary manner. Um, we need to collaborate with technology, uh, with people making uh, infrastructure, with policymakers and behavioral scientists to make the best out of it and to actually gain safety instead of perhaps uh, losing it. Um, what is clear from the research available today is that there are very co complex combined effects on behavior with increasing automation levels and that even new driving skills are needed in the future. So that means that road user education, training and testing need to be sort of reinvented and tailored to the new automated vehicles that are coming onto the market. And last but not least, we should include the perspective of non-automated road users in our work, such as pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, they must have correct expectations uh, of what automation can and cannot do to be able to interact safely with automation. So thank you very much for attention. Um, uh, these are just references. And this concludes my presentation today. OK. Uh -huh. uh, thank you so much for your very interesting and very didactic presentation. Uh, I also thank you for sharing your experience and in your expertise in this subject. I'm really impressed with the infrastructure that you have and all in the infrastructure in our experiments. Yeah, it's a different world, isn't it? So I was talking about automation and uh, in this very Dutch surroundings and um, we, we see the, the research uh, be, between um, uh, of the, about the interaction between cyclists and automation mm -hmm. as the third world. But this is, of course, a really weird idea to, to talk about the third world in this context. And, uh, but I, I hope you, will, you would uh, find it interesting uh, to have this perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, we have uh, questions here, but I would like to do the first one. Uh, how is the stage of the creation or formal rules and regulations for our main vehicles in Holland or Norwegian? Could you please talk a little about it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, at the moment, uh, um, uh, there, there, there is some experimentation allowed on Dutch roads with automated vehicles. Uh, those who want to test their vehicles or experiment, they have to ask for permission. Uh, there is a special, the, the ministry have uh, allowed in special situations that that is uh, possible. For instance, uh, for example, in the beginning of my presentation, I showed you this truck pl platooning picture. And there have been experiment, uh, experiments on the real road, on the real highways with truck platoons, uh, but it was in a controlled manner, but it de delivered valuable data. But um, apart from the cars that are actually allowed on the road, they have to be, uh, they have to be um, 
test it and they have to have permission like you know like the tesla cars or the automated versions of volvo or other brands uh then they are allowed on the road but those are partially automated cars we we don't have any fully automated cars on dutch road at the moment they are not allowed okay thank you uh we have uh, some questions here the, the second one is from samuel marx uh, good morning in the first experiment uh, how could participants recognize the vehicle as automatic? Um, the, the, shut, the, the shuttle. Um, that, uh, they, they, um, they, recognize, they could recognize it because of the, the looks of the shuttle. It was a, a short, uh, a, a very small bus, a mini bus. Uh, and that actually... Uh, was a vehicle that has been driving around on the Delft campus uh, in real life for a time. So they, the test persons actually knew this vehicle. So apart from their features, they know how to look, they had, most of the participants have actually seen it in real life as well. Good questions, by good question. I should have told you that. Okay. Uh, more one from uh, Gustavo Santos. Uh, based on the research with cyclists, do you think a public campaign for vulnerable users regarding a healthy relations between them and autonomous vehicle could be reduced accidents? Oh, that is a difficult question. Uh, I don't know. We, we know from, uh, from public campaigns in general that it is really difficult to prove uh any effects on safety so that that is difficult but information is is always good um there is a discussion going on uh in in uh in this regard uh who should be responsible for the safety of cyclists actually in this case should it should should the cyclist uh be responsible to look around carefully and notice that it is an automated vehicle and maybe not trustworthy or should it be the responsibility of the car and the car manufacturer to be able to deal with cyclists in a safe manner before it is allowed on the road so there's a debate going on about that whose responsibility is this and um I could say from, from a human factors perspective, it, it seems um, not the best way to just tell cyclists, well, you have to, to watch out better, okay? Uh, putting the responsibility on their heads. Um, uh, but uh, interesting question. And of course, providing uh, good information to cyclists is, and, and, and pedestrians is always good. But at the same time, you need to provide the information to the car drivers of these automated vehicles. Watch out, there may be cyclists and pedestrians on the road and your car might not be able to handle them. Watch out, you are responsible still as a driver in, in your partially automated car. But Good question as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also from Gustavo, he thank you for the presentation. And uh, my question, is, another question, is about the infrastructure requirements for CAI level four plus autonomous vehicle implementations. Could you speak a little about the infrastructure requirements, uh, the main topics for infrastructure? For autonomous vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, that 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 is uh, an area on its own which I didn't talk about. Um, but it is clear that uh, the the sensors that are used today in 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 uh, uh, cars that are partially automated and use these sensors, uh, that uh, clear markings uh, are really important. So uh, it is already shown if it's snowing or or raining heavily, it is much more difficult for the car to be able to stay on the road um, and in that regard it will need uh, adaptations to the infrastructure to, to, to ascertain that the, the sensors actually can read the information in, in the correct manner. Um, at the same time you still want the infrastructure to be clear and usable for all other road users that do not 
uh, have automated cars. And um, there are, in, in the Netherlands, at least, there is no regulations about this as yet, because such cars uh, are not allowed on the road. If, if level four or five, they are not there. They, they are not on the road uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but there's lots of study uh, going on into this topic, actually. How does the road have to look like? Um, can we set requirements for automated vehicles that they have to be able to use our current infrastructure maybe as a requirement um, before they are allowed on the road? Um, or is it the other way around that the cars will require a particular environment? Not solved yet at all, this, this, uh, this issue. But there's a lot of things going on in, in, in that area. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, more two questions, interesting questions. One for Ellen Miranda. Consider the experiment performed with cyclists. Do you think it, uh, the hesitation of participants in related with the existence of social interactions, eye contact, how to handle with this problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an interesting question as well. Uh, in, in current traffic, uh, it is often said that eye contact uh, between the cyclists or the pedestrians and the car driver, and they sort of negotiate and check if they have seen it other, is, is uh, really important. Uh, however, the research on this topic that has performed to date has mixed outcomes. Some studies actually show that the eye uh, contact is not important at all and that it only it plays a role in very specific situations where there is a really short distance between the cyclist and the car driver. Um, because in, in, uh, in, in, in other situations, it's really not visible, uh, uh, the driver. You cannot see its eyes. You assume you have eye contact, but you don't. You don't see it. And uh, nowadays, cars often have tinted wind uh, uh, tinted uh, shields, uh, and you don't see any driver whatsoever. Uh, so there is a lot of assumptions that that is important, but the actual studies that I've seen are non-conclusive. Some say there is uh, uh, there is some meaning, but only in a limited uh, amount of situations, and some say it doesn't really matter. Okay, thank you. And the question from Eric. Uh, in, many in many countries, traffic rules are not strictly followed, including by pedestrians. Have you done any study on what would be the impact of following the rules? No, we have not. But uh, just some anecdotal, uh, Evren, uh, uh, some sort of anecdotal uh, uh, findings. I told you just now that we had this AV shuttle, this small bus driving around on the campus and also on the campus of another university in the Netherlands. And uh, there were in, 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 in the first uh, weeks, um, we were curious uh, whether pedestrians would test the vehicle, you know, jumping in front of it, uh, just testing if it would stop for them and actually interrupting it, its route. Um, I'm not sure if you hint to that type of situations uh, with your question, but we noticed that this happened a few times. But pedestrians really get bored uh, quite easily about this. Well, indeed, when they jumped in front of the of the vehicle, it stopped. And then it was not really fun anymore to do that any longer. So that actually happened only a few times and died out really soon. Yeah, but we, I, didn't, I didn't do actual uh, 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 a more scientific study about it. No, not yet. Okay, uh, I'll do the, the last question. Uh, could you please speak a little more about the motion sickness uh, from people inside the autonomous vehicle, yeah? Did you, did you got to measure or do the experiment like this? Mm, yeah, I haven't done uh, <laughs> research on that topic myself, but a colleague, a colleague of mine have done it. And um, uh, it, it actually happens that people get sick. Uh, and you can imagine that clearly you need some visual cues if you sit in a car 
uh, to feel the motion that should be in accordance with what you see. And some people are much more sensitive to that than others, but some people also become sick in a normal car. And those group, that particular group of people is also sensitive to the same phenomenon uh, in an automated car. And uh, what, what the research is now concentrating on, can you uh, sort of adapt the kinematic features of your car um, in such a way that it is good uh, for people sensitive to motion sickness? And that would help not only automated cars, actually, that, would, that knowledge would also benefit the traditional cars. So there is, there is uh, research going on, um, but I'm not doing that myself. Okay. So, Marham, uh, I would like to thank you again for your time with us. Uh, I really appreciate uh, be here with us. So, uh, our audience is very good. We got 80 uh, people. Uh, watching a lot of people That's also lot. yeah yeah yes so, i'm sorry i have no idea I, it is it is so so weird to present on, in front of a screen and um i i cannot get used to it but uh, thank you for inviting me um i i i really hope it was interesting for the audience and uh, thank you very much that 80 people have joined uh that's that's great actually uh i was happy to do this and uh what i want to ask will this video be online then yeah uh, afterwards yeah you'll be a uh, record in youtube i will send to you the the link okay. and if you like to see or to share with someone. Thank you all. Okay. 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 Well, Thank I you. Want to... Okay. Please. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah. Thanks again, and good luck with the remainder of all your interesting lectures in this symposium. Okay. Okay. Happy to do this. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Maja. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Adalberto, Mateus, Olga, Ivita. Bye bye.